is if it is true that the exceptional measure, which are involved in the state of exception, are the, are the result of a political crisis, which as such cannot be really understood on the, only on the political, juridic, on the juridical constitutional sphere, then these measures find themselves in the paradoxical situation of being <coughs> juridical measures which cannot be understood in the sphere of law, inside the law. Something as the legal form or what cannot have a legal form. On the other hand, if it's true that the exception is the device, the, the dispositive, as Foucault would have put it, by means of which law refers to the life and includes the life itself by means of its own suspension, then a theory of the state of exception is the preliminary condition in order to define the relation which links and at the same time abandons the life to the law. So it is a, this no man's land between the juridical and the public law and the politics, which I'm trying to explore. It's only if uh, the veil which uh, covers this uh, zone will be lifted, it's only in this case that we would perhaps be able to uh, ask the question, which uh, is always repeated in the history of the Western politics, what does it mean to act politically? So among the elements which uh, make difficult the definition of the state of exception, there is certainly the strict relationship it has with civil war, with insurrection and resistance. As civil war is, of course, the contrary of a normal state, it uh, locates itself in a zone of indecidability with respect to the state of exception, which is the normal response of state authority to civil war. Thus, uh, in the 20th century, we can witness to a paradoxical phenomenon which has been defined as a legal civil war. Let's say the case of the Nazi regime. Immediately after that Hitler took the power, sometimes some, some you say that he took the power, the power was given to them. Uh, the 20th, uh, February 20, 1930, he uh, propagated, propagated you say, yes, a decree for the protection of the people and the state, which suspended the articles of the divine constitution concerning the civil liberties. And he could do this on the base of the article 48 of the divine constitution and who authorized the state of, and the state of exception in case of uh, when the security or the public order were threatened. This decree was never revoked, so that we could say that the whole of the Nazi regime was a state of exception who lasted for 12 years. And in this sense, a modern totalitarianism, totalitarianism can be defined as the restoration by means of the state of exception of a, of a legal civil war which allows the physical elimination not only of political enemies, but of the whole categories of, of citizens, which for one reason or another cannot be integrated in the political system. Thus, the voluntary, and since then, since the moment, the voluntary creation of a, a permanent state of exception even if it's not always officially declared, has become one of the essential tasks of modern states, including 
those states who declare themselves to be democracies. Sense the state of exception tends today to present itself as the dominant paradigm of government in contemporary politics. It's a very important thing that this transformation was, me was meant to be as a provisional and exceptional measure in a normal technique of government threatens to transform completely and it has already completely transformed the structure and the meaning of the traditional distinction between the different kinds of constitutions. In the sense, we could say the state of exception is a kind of threshold of indetermination between democracy, uh, dictatorship, etc., etc. The state of Israel is a good example of the of how, when, if the state of exception is prolonged after a certain moment, then all democratic institutions necessarily collapse. And in a way, it's also what happened in Weimar, the Weimar Republic. It's not Hitler who invented the state of exception, it was the, it was the Weimar government, so the social democratic governments, who already began massive usage of this. I, I mentioned this expression, uh, uh, world civil war, which I think is very interesting. What is also very interesting is that this expression can be found in the same year, 1961, in Anna Arendt's book on revolution and in Karl Schmidt's book on the theory of the partisan. So, very distant and enemy photos city has mentioned this uh, word before. Another thing I mentioned, it's uh, interesting to perhaps to work here. When I spoke, when I said that in the French uh, tradition, the state of exception is called état de siege fictif ou politique, fictitious or political state of siege, and this goes back to the French Revolution. So we can say that if, we, if you ask when the state of exception appeared in modernity, it appeared the first time in the context of the French Revolutionary Revolution, and especially during the first years of the Napoleon power. So perhaps if you, if you need a date, uh, it's perhaps uh, uh, 24 December 1811, when uh, for the first time a state of siege was conceived independently of any military situation. And before the state of siege was meant when a city was invested by the army of the enemy. Now for the first time in this decree, a state of siege can be decreed, uh, that it can be promulgated, declared, even if there is nothing as an enemy army. That's why then, then, for the first time, the French scholars speak of a political or fictitious state of siege in relationship to the militant, real state of siege. The, the Anglo-Saxon Jewish uh, political tradition prefer to speak in the sense of a fancied emergency. When you have the state, fancied emergency. And the Nazi jurists, uh, their part, they prefer to speak uh, openly of a revolt in Ausnahmezustand, a willed state of exception, a will in order to restore the Nazi state. 